Hi there, welcome to this um, webinar today. We ran a series of three webinars last uh, year running, uh, introducing the core concepts of social leadership, which you can find on the YouTube channel. Uh, we've got nine uh, webinars lined up for this year, and this is the third of those of that nine. If you want to subscribe to any further ones that we have this year, then please see our website, seasaltlearning.com. Um, just a little note on the chat interface, please can you make sure that you switch your chat to everyone just so that we can all see your messages if you do post them up. There'll be time at the end where we can have a Q&A session uh, and you can ask questions throughout the, the webinar today as well. So uh, we'll flag those up to Julian as he goes through the presentation. Um, as per last time, we're going to be re recording this and we'll be posting it up on YouTube. Uh, you'll probably be able to see the recording of this tomorrow. Uh, so that leads me to hand over to Julian, and today's topic is community. Hi, Julian. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, I'm working off my iPad today, so you'll have to forgive me if it's ever so slightly clunky. I'm just going to try and share my screen, uh, which I will bring up here. And uh, once that comes up, there we are. You should be able to hopefully see the introductory slide. There we are, community and social leadership. Now, whilst thanks, Paul. Whilst um, whilst I'm uh, running through things today, if you do type any questions into the chat box, I will be able to see them uh, pop up as a message at the top of the screen. So do feel free to interrupt as much as you like uh, as we go through today, uh, because this is a working out loud session. So if you've seen any of my presentations before, you might be familiar with this slide. Um, it means that um, these are reflective sessions, co-creative, um, sharing, if you like, the, the um, latest thinking and ideas uh, that I'm working on around social leadership. So um, I'm not gonna be reading you the chapter from the book. I'm sharing quite a lot of images from uh, the next book, actually, on, on uh, the first 100 days of social leadership and also a bit of new work as well. So, um, as Paul said, we are going to be exploring uh, this model, which is uh, the net model of uh, social leadership. I'll just give you a very quick uh, tour of it now, and we're going to be focusing on that quadrant which sits at the top right that says community. But I like to just uh, set the, the context of the journey. Um, this is really about uh, social leaders using the authority that is granted to them by the community itself. So it's not about the formal authority given to us by our position within an organisation. It's about the reputation based authority that sits um, within community. So the first step for a social leader to take over here on the left is curation to choose their space to actively um, think where will they uh, set the foundations for their social leadership. Uh, then to understand how storytelling works. Um, we had a, a webinar a couple of months ago on storytelling, which uh, was rather fun looking at different modes and mechanisms of storytelling. It's a very important skill in the social age to understand how stories actually work, not just how we broadcast stories, but how stories are co-created and how they flow through systems. So why is it that some stories move fast whilst others uh, just grind to a halt? Formal stories, of course, get pushed through formal systems, but social stories get spread, get amplified um, if they're engaging, if they're magnetic, if they're relevant, uh, if they're deeply authentic. So sharing again, understanding how do stories get shared. Those are the kind of foundations of social leadership. We're just starting into this next quadrant, which is really, uh, in many ways, the most exciting, uh, I think, because it's about how do we get from that foundational understanding to really understand how communities work and the role we play within those communities. That's what we're going to explore today. How that lets us earn our reputation, and, and I use that word carefully, we have to earn a reputation. It's not, um, it's not demanded, it's not bought, um, it's earned through, through actions over time. And then how that reputation leads to social authority, the kind of authority which is granted to us by the community itself. Once we have that in place, then we're able to, um, we're able to co-create effectively, to, to do things within our community, to make sense of things, uh, to cut through the noise, to find the signal. Uh, social capital is about our responsibility, really, to ensure that our organisations are increasingly fair, that they are 
um, socially responsible, that they hear all the voices, not just the loudest voices. Hence, we are able to collaborate. Now, the, the journey is a circle. It's represented like that because we constantly revisit each of those areas. We don't just curate one space. We will um, come back to that over time and continue to build our reputation and so on. But this is the initial type of journey. Um, I, I think we mentioned there's a series of, uh, of these pieces. We're here at number six. This is actually the sixth webinar in the series of 12. And you'll see that we talked about the foundations, the need. We've talked in depth about curation, storytelling and sharing. So now we're, we're into community. And um, well, I realized that uh, I forgot to update this slide. So we'll ignore this one, uh, <laughs> ignore that. We're going to actually look at uh, how communities work. We're going to uh, look at the purpose of communities. Why do social leaders need communities? And we're going to talk about how we grow uh, communities over time. So let's, uh, let's start on our journey. And I say, please uh, feel free to interrupt as we go. We're only a small group today. So why do, why do social leaders need a community? Well, I mean, I suppose one simple answer to that is because they're social leaders. If you're a formal leader, if you're uh, a, a, a kind of tyrant, you probably don't need a community at all. You can just exercise your authority through your formal power. But the point of the community for social leaders is to help them see the whole picture, to make sense of what's going on beyond their own personal viewpoint. Um, we can really say that social leaders are effective because of their community around them. Not just the way that their community might challenge them, might support them, but the way that it might represent different perspectives. It may help them maintain a tempo of action. It, it can allow them to, it can allow us, I should say, as social leaders to kind of hold a mirror up to the, the world around us and say, what does this mean, not just for me, but for my organization, for my team in the world today? We could really sort of summarize that by saying communities are sense making entities. They let us figure out the full picture by ourselves. We may well have all sorts of great strengths um, and probably all sorts of great weaknesses as well. But together, if we build the right communities around us, we can be stronger, we can be more effective. Indeed, we could go further than that. I could say today, if you employ somebody or if you buy somebody's time through a contract, if you earn the right, you may also get access to their community, the people around them, um, that sense-making capability. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is uh, uh, quite a key part of it. This is one of the illustrations actually from the, the, the new book, and it talks about where will I hear new voices? And it probably won't surprise you to know that this is it's sort of sketched up in, in relation to some of the conversations that we've heard recently about um, echo chambers, about uh, the perils of uh, particularly online communities. And I think it's valuable in terms of our social leadership journey to be thinking about um, where do I hear these different things? So where do I hear voices that agree with me? but where do I hear the voices that, that challenge me? Um, particularly, where are the voices of dissent? This is one of the things that I, I often get asked by organizations when they say, you know, how will we know when we're doing things right? As we're trying to make our organization more socially dynamic, more engaged, um, how will we know that we're actually getting anywhere on that journey? And usually the, the, the first thing I'll say is, you'll know you're starting to win, if you start to hear voices of dissent. But crucially, um, if you're willing to take action based upon those voices. So it's, it's always a kind of a, a two-way journey. That community is very much about that. It's not about other people, it's about us and other people. So hearing, uh, many organizations hear stories of dissent. They just don't want to hear them. So they try to silence them or deny them or solve what's being said whilst uh, a truly socially engaged organization will uh, hear voices of dissent and will be willing to learn from them, not, not simply to try to own or control them. Indeed, that's one of the core differences between a formal organization and a socially dynamic one, is that a formal organization tends to operate on the baseline assumption that somehow it owns and controls the story, that somehow 
um, you know, they're doing you a favor by letting you be there. Whilst a socially dynamic organization recognizes that the strength it has inherently comes from the community. So it's willing to hear these different voices. So it's an important question for a social leader to ask, you know, where will I hear new voices, not just the voices that I know I'm comfortable with, have established relationships with, and understand the significance of, where will I hear these different perspectives? What's an echo and what's a fresh kind of, of view? Um, this is a, another one of the, the sketches from the book, and I just sort of put it in here because I was, uh, I was um, having a, I'm just back from uh, a nine day holiday actually, so today is my first day. Um, I was having one of those sort of reflective uh, moments and it took me back to, to the rather obvious thing. You know, professional is a mindset, and it's, not a, it's not a suit, it's not the trappings of power. Um, professional, I think, in the social age is not having the, uh, yeah, those trappings of power. It's not having a formal position and a formal authority and some kind of status within a hierarchy. Professional is about a mindset that's willing to learn, that is humble, that is reflective, that is fair above all, um, a, a mindset um, that sits at the heart of, of social leadership. And I'll, I'll just come back once more to that, that um, key difference between formal and social leadership. Formal leaders are given their authority by the organization. Social leaders earn their authority within a community. So it's still given to you by somebody else, but it's given to you by the community rather than the um, organization. So in that sense, if you like, professional in the social age isn't going to be something awarded to us by the organization or by a membership body. It's going to be something that's awarded to us by the, the community itself. So we have these two types of power, the, the formal power and social power. And you know, formal power alone does let us get a lot of things done. Formal power is very good at um, achieving effects at scale. Uh, about um, production, about distribution. It's often very good at the managing of resources, um, about allocation of work. It's, it's good at these things which can be systematized, which can be um, scaled. But formal power isn't really enough. Uh, the reason I say that is because much of what we need in order to be effective isn't easily captured within uh, one of those formal relationships. It comes back to that jigsaw slide we had earlier. You know, social power, um, that which sits within the community, is more likely to let us hear weak signals, not just to hear strong broadcast uh, stories, but the weak stories that sit within the system that we may need to hear. But the reason why both these slides say alone, so formal power alone is not enough, and social power alone is not enough. We, we really need both. And that's the relationship fundamentally between the formal organizational structure and the communities that uh, surround a social leader. We need to be able to hear what's happening in the formal hierarchy, but we also need to be able to hear what's happening and have access to that expertise in the social um, community. What does community give us? Well, in some ways, it gives us momentum. Um, I mean, funnily enough, it, it, today I was thinking, um, you know, I came back from holiday and I had 360 odd emails in, in the inbox and a, a stack of things to do. And I also broke a filling when I was on holiday. So the top of my list was, let's get that sorted. Um, and it, to be honest, it would have been easy to kind of think, well, do I need to run this webinar today? Maybe I could, you know, just drop out of it. Maybe we could have canceled it. Why, why did we do it? Well partly because I sort of have to recognize that having a community which has expectations of, you know, of us, much as we have expectations of our communities, gives us some momentum. Um, if I hadn't done this today, I wouldn't have had to prepare the slides for it, and I wouldn't have, you know, developed my thinking that much further. So um, a key thing that communities can actually help us do is maintain a momentum. And I, I don't mean a momentum just in terms of, the jobs that we have to do. I mean, in terms of our thinking, in terms of our learning. And that's important because uh, a key shift in the social age is that we no longer learn all our stuff in one go. 
and then continue forever with the stuff that we've already learned. We have to continuously learn. So the, the impetus, um, the incentive even to do that from our communities can be, can be very important. And then, uh, you know, helping hands, the community around us um, is a community that if we support it appropriately, will be willing to help us when we need it. And when I say support it appropriately, one of the things I say in the social leadership book is that uh, social leaders invest in their community without any expectation of reciprocity. So I, I won't say to, to, to Susie or to Gail or to John, you know, if I do this thing for you, will you reward me or repay me in this way? That's um, not what social leadership's about. It's more about selflessly investing in the community, in the belief that if the time comes when, um, when I need support, the community will be there to, uh, to support me. Um, and that's, I guess, the non-transactional nature of the bonds that hold communities together. I'll just um, allow myself a sort of slight distraction at this point because that, that theme of the bonds that hold communities together is one that I'm exploring in the landscape of trust research. So if you, um, I know some of you have, um, I've already talked to some of you before about the landscape of trust uh, research. It's a global research project looking at how trust sits within systems, how it sits within communities, within organizations, within technologies and the way that trust forms the bonds that hold that community together. So in many ways, by investing in social leadership, we are strengthening um, bonds of, of trust. And trust is one of the things we call upon when we, when we reach out and ask for that help. Um, I'll send a follow-up email to, to everyone in, in the group today, just with the link to that research. And if you, if you are interested, do, uh, do jump in and, and take part. So in some ways, community is about uncertainty. Um, it's about uh, having the people around you, the resources around you, the thinking around you to help us to cater for uncertainty. If we look at the evolutionary imperative for society, it's one of being better in it than outside of it. The cost of being within a community is always marginally less than the peril of being outside the community. If at any point the cost becomes too high, we will simply leave. So there always is something that comes back to us, but it may just not happen in the moment. And that's the difference between a, a transactional relationship and a, a, a relationship or trust-based relationship. If we have confidence in the bonds that hold us together, and it has to be confidence, it can't ever be an absolute bond because it's not contractual, um, then we believe that the community will support us when the time comes. And some of the early stage research kind of points to this. So for about 35% of people uh, out of the prototype group of, of 5,000 um, respondents for, for the trust research, um, about 35% said that trust is held in a contract. But for 65%, it's held in other people. Um, trust is, broadly speaking, about people. Uh, and communities are obviously about people. So I think it's, it's hard to, to separate the, tr the, the, the two. Um, and when we think about community, it's not, um, it's not a simple broadcast conversation. It's not uh, one linear, one track um, space. Uh, communities have multiple conversations. They're often highly chaotic. Um, they're rarely linear. Uh, so we have to tune into a community. And of course, there's a fairly predictable pattern of how we do that. So within organizations, we have to think about how are we going to encourage, nurture, support the development of our communities? How are we going to listen to what they need? Um, you may, may remember earlier I said that uh, a socially dynamic organisation is one that's willing to hear voices of dissent and engage in a conversation with them. Not to hear those voices and say I have the answer, but to listen with humility and then uh, co-create the, the solution. Um, 
really that's the new balance that we look for in a socially dynamic organization it's one that's willing to nurture and support communities because it believes that communities will help it to innovate to be more agile to be more dynamic so let's you know let's get into this the the, the purpose of community for a social leader what is the the purpose well this is probably just a subset of all possible purposes that communities may serve. We've talked already about sense making. Um, some communities will be communities of enlightenment. We will go there to learn new stuff. You know, we may not actually contribute much to those communities. We could be the fly on the wall just listening, but that's okay. We need some communities like that. Indeed, uh, just referring back to one of the slides earlier, if we're going to avoid bias and echoes, we must actively seek out communities that are communities of enlightenment, not communities of confirmation. I was uh, I've been doing some work around the NHS recently, and that's one of the messages that we've been exploring together is um, how much are we just engaged with people with the same views as us, rather than being engaged actively with dissenting views not to challenge them or dismiss them but simply to understand them better so being in, engaged uh, with difference is important I, I, engaged in communities where we can be enlightened is important we obviously need those typical things of challenge and support um, some communities uh, have a purpose which is largely one of status you know if you are in that community it grants you a certain status and that's okay it's, it's a perfectly good reason to be engaged in a community it's not the only reason of course but it's not a bad reason um, some communities will be ones of amplification the purpose of the community is to help messages to spread um, but some will be of subversion i mean they, they may be one and the same thing we may be trying to amplify subversive messages but this this word is an important one um, within the formal system the notion of subversion is bad it's it's an attack on the formal system Within the social system, subversion is good. It allows us to challenge preconceptions and assumptions. It allows us to explore what needs to be changed. So really, one of the benefits for an organization that becomes socially dynamic is its ability to hear subversive voices. But I should be clear, not voices that mindlessly attack it or try to destroy it, but rather voices which say, there's another way to do this. I've got an idea, you know, can we try this? Very often, organizations are good at accreting system, process, and control that holds them in the current space. But to be truly dynamic, they need to be able to dismantle some of that legacy, some of that weight they carry behind them. Where, where do these communities sit? Well, you know, this is a, a simplification, really. Some communities are visible. Uh, they may well be formal communities of practice that are set up by the organization. Team structures form communities in themselves. Different locations may be communities. So some communities are visible, formal and internal. But many of the communities that will be engaged in as social leaders will be external or semi-external to the organization. They will at the very least be permeable. And they may be entirely social. Um, indeed, many of the communities could be totally hidden to the, the organization itself. And we've talked a little about this already. What kind of bonds will hold together these, um, these communities? Well, some will be uh, bonds of trust. Uh, some will be bonds that are contractual. You know, people will be held together by contractual bonds, but without trust, they may not form a high functioning community, um, a, a community which is permissive of discussion, which has low consequence. Um, high functioning communities will typically have shared values but the interesting thing about shared values is they have to emerge from within the system so you can impose a contract from externally but um, shared values have to emerge inside the system so that uh, values-based bonds are important relationships based on shared values and shared goals are, are important sometimes the bonds that we have are ones of pure faith and i don't specifically mean in the religious context i'm really meaning um bonds uh, of, of faith faith and belief that we are doing the right thing so if a, an organization has social purpose which i, I say with some care because we can um it can be deemed to be a sort of a soft and woolly thing to talk about the social purpose of an organization but increasingly organizations do need 
social purpose. They certainly need to be socially responsible. If you've been following the uh, frankly incredulous story of uh, United Airlines in, in the last week or so, and um, the way that their, their operational planning required them to remove passengers from flights to let their crew fly around, you know, you, the, the ultimate expression of that is a 69-year-old doctor being beaten up effectively and dragged off an airplane. That's not a socially responsible thing to do. And in, in a time where that story is videoed and amplified and spread, it's clearly been a massive public relation disaster for them. Um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's something they will be known for for years to come. Now, it's one action taken by one, two or three people at a very granular part of the system. But because of the nature of communities and the nature of how stories spread in the social age, it's become a significant pressure on their fundamental operating model. And it speaks to an organization which at heart is geared around convenience and scale and um, effectiveness. And one that balances that with social responsibility and fairness, because clearly the action that was taken was neither responsible nor fair. And today, if we fail to take actions that are responsible or fair, then the story is likely to spread faster. So one of the key things we have to do as social leaders is explore this new world that we're in. It's unlikely that I or you or anyone we know has all of the answers. So a key purpose of communities in um, social leadership is just to help us explore, to explore within good company. Let's, let's just take a bit of time to think about how do communities actually work? Well, um, I've got a sequence of slides here that I'm still playing around with just to explore the nature of community itself. If we consider everyone, you know, everyone that's in the world around us, there are many uh, different people and uh, we're there in the middle, the orange dot. Now, we know some of those people directly. Um, and in, in, I suppose, in the terms which most of us have grown up with, we have met them face to face. We have shaken their hand, looked them in the eye, shared some kind of experience. So people that we've worked with, people that we know, people that, who are our friends or our, our mentors or our teachers. So a small subset of people we know, and they, they could form one community. Um, but we also have... Uh, groups outside of that. So, you know, I've still got in the centre here the, the, the people who I know directly. But if I'm lucky, some of them will, will belong to communities that contain people who I've never met directly. Now, by interacting with them, by being invited into that community, I suddenly have a, a scaling effect. So I'm able to hear the stories which are told in that community. I have some access to the sense-making capability of that community. And there's a chance that my own story will be heard out into that community. And this is typically how we, how we engage many, many of our, our communities. And of course, we, we don't just have one of those, we have multiple of those. So everybody that we know directly may lead to a second order effect of, um, of people uh, who lead out there. So as social leaders, we are members of, of a number of different communities. This, slide is really intended to illustrate second, third and fourth degree effects. And this really sits at the heart of how amplification occurs. So just back to my cup of English tea there to, to keep me going. Um, so if we belong to this community on the right here, for example, which um, uh, I have a direct connection into, somebody in that community may be connected into another community. And so there's a chance that if my story is compelling and engaging, it will spread into that second community and indeed potentially into a third community. Now, when we see the massive amplification of stories, this is how it happens. It runs through first, second, third and fourth degree effects. Um, people who know people who know people. But crucially, these are not level systems. Um, the people that cross over between communities who may get uh, a story spread will be nodes within the system, high reputation individuals. If that individual that sits in two communities has no reputation or a very poor reputation, then it's most unlikely that they'll be listened to in either of those communities. We'll come back to that notion of nodes and amplifiers later. 
a key thing for us to remember is of course that no matter how many communities we see around us there are many many more that are entirely invisible and hidden to us indeed this is a, 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 a well we can see much of the social system around us but in fact much of the social system is entirely hidden to us we don't even have first degree connections into it the thing i'm trying to capture here is an interesting new effect um, of the deep connectivity we have in the social age. And this is communities that we are engaged with, quite often in very high functioning ways that we have no first degree connections with. So I can be a member of a community that's populated by individuals or subgroups who all know each other, who have high bonds of trust, who may have shared vision, values, purpose, and goals, who have never met each other in that thing we like to call the real world. And one of the, the big hangovers um, that I often get confronted with is this notion that it's better if we meet in real life. We all feel it, many organizations think it and express it, that it's better to get together. Well, it's certainly different to get together. You know, if we were having this conversation now in a coffee shop together, we'd be looking each other in the eye, we'd be sharing body language, we'd be uh, mirroring and reflecting each other's behavior back to us. We build social cohesion faster in all likelihood. Um, but it's not to say we'd do it better. Uh, in fact, there appears to be some good evidence that, um, that communities are different that form online. But that doesn't mean they're better, it just means they're different. And this is why I think there's great value in understanding how, how communities differ when they meet face to face and when they um, only ever meet online in virtual communities. We know that in virtual communities, in online communities, um, things can be very different. Um, so uh, identity can be different. All we have to go, you can see my video, but I can't see anybody else's video. All I have to go on is the name you've written in a box, which may be made up, who knows? Um, you know, we, we can only judge each other in online spaces by the ways that we uh, consciously project and interact with each other. So um, this is a, a, an interesting area for further research. This is what I'm starting to try to look at with the trust research. How does trust differ in communities that never meet face-to-face? -face? Um, I think it's a really fascinating area. And of course, some of these communities are formal, but the vast majority are almost entirely social in nature. This um, slide here is, is, is really um, one of the slides exploring the nature of those bonds that, that tie us together. It's about social ties. So if, 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 you, if you know from sociology, we have this notion of weak and strong social ties. Everybody that you know are connected with forms a, a weak social tie. Once we know each other, we have a weak social tie. If we actually do something together, if we build trust between us, if we have shared experiences, we're thrown together in some way, we may emerge from that with a strong social tie. And those are the kind of the high trust, deeply valued relationships. There does seem to be some evidence that through collaborative technology, uh, we are now building larger numbers of strong social ties that are more geographically distributed. And indeed, the journey towards social leadership is partly about actively cultivating those wider networks of ties. Weak social ties are fine, but strong social ties are what really count. If we share strong social ties, we are more likely to help and support each other. So very much one can view the journey towards social leadership as broadening and strengthening our networks of strong social ties. Why is that important? Well, if we, if we think about amplification, um, formal stories get pushed through formal systems. That's the arrow on the top. You know, we can broadcast the story through a formal system. Social stories flow through networks, but they don't flow um, evenly. They flow often through those strong social ties, those high reputation connections, the nodes within the network. I'm not going to dwell on this because I covered this in some detail um, on the previous webinar, and I, I can't quite remember who was on that or not, so I don't want to bore anybody, but this is a, a body of work I'm doing at the moment around types of power. If you like, this is the types of bonds that exist if I just flip up, um, in the, the social networks here, the types of power that exist can broadly fall into three categories. 
um, individual power we, we looked at, you know, the people I know directly and can influence or even control directly. Hierarchical power is the type of power which exists within formal systems. It's positional authority um, given to us uh, by the organization. Um, networks power is, is, is not particularly a new type of power but its ability to operate at scale has been radically transformed by the democratization and emergence of social collaborative technologies. So networks power, which is really about social leadership, the power which is given to us by the community, um, can subvert hierarchical power, it can flow around it. So as social leaders, we build strong networks power. As formal leaders, we have strong hierarchical power. And if we go back to, to this uh, diagram here, formal stories flow through formal relationships in formal systems at the top, but social stories and reputational based authority flows through the, the social community based on that reputational uh, networked type of power here. So really, it's almost a representation of how we grow social leadership through the development of, of networked authority. And this is what we sort of end up with, is, is the strong social ties, the high reputation individuals within our network form these nodes. So we are able to be effective at scale because of this multi-layered um, type of community. Not everybody is good at everything. We all specialize in different ways. Um, but as we build our networks and we belong to many different communities, um, we're effectively building out the number of nodes that exist within our, our network. This uh, slide I did use last time in the, in the webinar on storytelling, but I, I used it again, uh, mainly because I rather like it. It's the, uh, it's the way that stories battle for, um, for power. So uh, it's a clear feature of social systems. If you look at something like Twitter or Yammer or Jive, we see stories battling for um, authenticity, for authority, um, battling to be heard the loudest, compelling stories that are magnified um, and spread through a system are more likely to, to triumph, um, not simply stories that are sort of fired out with, with great strength. So the purpose of community is to allow us to hear the right stories and to have the right stories type of, to, uh, the, the, the stories to be spread. We operate effectively uh, within the, the arms of our community. If we earn the right to be supported, it's likely that we will be supported. If we demand that we are supported using our formal power, we'll only ever get the support that sits within the formal hierarchy and bonds of hierarchical power that exist within the organization. You can give people as much as you like of assets and infrastructure, but none of that represents the arms of the community itself. That only comes through bonds of, of trust. So how would we go about you know, growing our community? Well, um, I thought I'd share one of the other illustrations. I think this is the first time I've shared this one. It's, it's a sort of rather whimsical notion of how do you hatch a community? Because of course, it's not just about um, about joining communities that already exist. Sometimes we have to grow new communities in new organizations for new teams, for new projects, around new questions. These are some of the core skills for a social leader to understand how would they go about doing that? Because it's not just about the technology, it's not just about saying, well, you know, here's a new Yammer, a, a new Yammer group or here's a new Slack group. Now we have a community. We don't. The, the, the technology gives us a space, but we have to forge those bonds of trust. We have to find our shared purpose and shared values. If we want to hatch a community, we have to uh, nurture it. We have to incubate it. And slowly, it will, um, it will start to, to take shape. So the kinds of questions that, um, that we need to answer are to think first of all, where are our communities? Well, our formal communities are generally quite easy to identify. We can look around us at the, the teams that we're in, at the um, uh, professional bodies that we belong to, uh, at our, our social groups around us, and we can quite easily see our, our visible and obvious um, communities. But if we look before that, uh, sorry, beyond that, 
uh, let's think about where are your other communities. So the ones that are entirely invisible. Think about the um, groups you may be connected with around shared ideas, around shared curiosity, possibly communities of dissent that you're connected with, communities of aspiration. Um, there's an interesting thing about culture, which is that it's, it's co-created by everybody within a community. And formal organizations often aspire to have strong cultures, but it's often subversive or um, strong socially coherent communities that have the strongest cultures because everybody within them is, is fighting uh, for the same thing. They become coherent, uh, they become strong um, almost through their adversity. Uh, indeed, this is one of the, the messages I quite often find myself sharing with organizations that talk about innovation that say, you know, how can we be more innovative? Well, um, the answer to that is, is not necessarily by um, creating a process for innovation, but rather by nurture, nurturing and developing um, a culture in which innovation will, will happen. One of the simplest ways to uh, grow our communities is to earn the right to be invited into them. And we may earn that right partly by introducing other people into our communities. And this is a, an interesting point that relates again to trust, in fact. Um, some of the early research I've done are around um, problem solving in uh, strongly technical communities shows how people are generally willing to reach out to their first degree connections, their strong social ties, the people they know well, but they may also be willing to reach out and include within that community second degree ties. So people they don't know directly, but somebody that you vouch for. So that's interesting because it sets up a, a space of potential. So suddenly we're all together in a community with some people we know and some people we don't know, but we have enough trust to have them in that community because somebody that we know knows that person. Now, if that person earns our respect effectively, if they act in a trustworthy manner, then they may become one of our strong social ties. They, the, the community may become high functioning and coherent and form its own culture and so on and so forth. If that person betrays our trust in some way, if they fail to live up to the expectation and promise, not only will they themselves um, fail to become part of a high functioning and coherent community, but they may actually actively damage the reputation of the person that recommended them in there in the first place. So there can be a, a consequence for the introducer if the person that they introduced somehow fails to either respect or integrate into the community. So it's, it's really an act of trust to introduce people into communities, but by demonstrating that trust, we will sometimes earn the trust that other people will introduce us further. This is often quite a practical first step to get people to analyze the communities they're in and then ask around and say, does anybody know, can anybody help me find a community that's interested in this thing? Um, so generosity, uh, which is something else which, which social leaders should really work on, it, it can in itself lead to um, a strengthening of our, our reputation. I guess the, the, the three key questions that we would um, find ourselves asking is which communities should I join, but then which communities should I leave and which community will I need to build? Um, because sometimes we're in communities as a legacy. We just, we joined them at some point. We're no longer actively learning or contributing to them. Um, we're just loitering. So we may need to actively leave them because we have a limited amount of social capital. We have limited energy and momentum. And we may want to invest that in joining a new community or indeed starting a new community. One of the groups that uh, we're working with at the moment is a collaborating out loud group. Um, it's a spontaneous emergent group within the NHS. I don't actually know if any of you on the call here today are, are, are in that space, but it's a group that's founded, a community founded around collaboration. Um, so somebody has decided that we need better collaboration. So I'm going to build a community specifically focused on doing that and collaborating out loud. And those are really the fundamental decisions that we take. While we do all this, when we consider communities, we have to think about um, 
not just people who have high social capital and are able to engage easily and effectively, but also uh, people who may be disenfranchised, disempowered, or voiceless for all sorts of reasons. These may be, um, uh, um, it may be as simple as a uh, misunderstanding or inability to access or inability to use technology. But very often it's beyond that. It's different cultural factors. It may be uh, questions of gender, of sexuality, of, um, of fairness, uh, of globally differentiated populations with different legal, moral and ethical views of um, what's right, what's, um, you know, what's fair. I see. Thanks for your note there, John. I see you're, you're diving out. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so a key role for social leaders is to um, speak up for those people who have no voice and to ensure that the um, to ensure that the community as a whole is nurturing and, and developmental. So I'm going to actually just yeah I'm going to um, to um, wrap up the the session today. Sorry for the slightly abrupt uh, ending there. I thought I had one other slide. Um, the uh, so that's been just a little exploration of community in social leadership. It's kind of a linking um, piece. Um, in the next webinar, I'll I see your question there, Gail. I'll come on to that in just a second. In um, the next webinar, we're going to talk about reputation in social leadership. Um, to 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 go on to that sort of magical thing. How do we build reputation once we're within those communities? Now I'm just going on to the questions here. Here we are. So Gail's asking, uh, how do we encourage shared leadership and commitment within a community around our purpose once the community is hatched? Um, well, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, an interesting question. Um, I suppose the, 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 the best way I can answer that, um, without understanding, if you like, the, the full context of what you're looking at, is that we would co-create the purpose itself. Um, around June or July this year, I'll publish a, a major body of work around organizational change, looking at how organizations change and how they find their direction in change. And one of the key messages of that work is going to be about um, the co-creation of change. Um, one of the, the um, strongest ways of generating engagement, if you like that, that shared leadership and shared commitment, is by effectively opening up a space to find shared purpose so um, for as long as we're asking people to subscribe to our own view of purpose we are in some ways leaving ourselves unable to hear um, the, the views of others so um, on the one hand I, I'd sort of answer it uh, like that the way that we, we encourage uh, shared leadership and commitment is by creating a space to find shared purpose. Another way I guess I could answer that is, um, is we can think about the ways that people are recognized and rewarded. So one of the things um, that organizations often find is that they haven't considered or don't understand how to recognize and reward engagement in social communities they sort of start by believing their challenge is to get engagement. Once they have it, they don't really know how to thank people for it. Now, people typically don't want, um, well, they don't want formal thanks for a start. They don't want a certificate saying thanks for engaging. They don't particularly want money either. In the trust research, we've shown that people don't particularly want sort of currency-based reward. The three top things they ask for are um, freedom, the ability to explore, to have their voice heard. They want uh, opportunity and uh, they want to build a legacy from it. So uh, again, maybe if we're looking to encourage, I'm trying to sort of relate back to your question, Gail, to encourage that shared leadership and commitment, we may need to think about, well, how will we reward people for that? How will we be providing opportunities? How will we be providing a legacy, something tangible that's taken forward? Um, and that may be one way of encouraging um, encouraging in engagement. I hope that uh, in in some way answers uh, answers your question. Um, I'm just going to um, uh, bring up 
uh, contact details here. Oh, thanks, Gail. I, I, I'm not sure if that was a, a full answer, but do do um, you know drop me a note if you have any other questions. We'll um, we will make this uh, the recording of this session available along with all the others. Um, if you don't have a copy of the Social Leadership Handbook already, do drop me a note and I'll happily send you a, a, a copy out. Um, and um, we, oh, thank you, Dean. That's very kind of you. We, uh, I quite enjoyed this. I like these small group sessions because we can just be very relaxed and informal. Uh, but we'll send an email out to everyone to, to share um, a few resources uh, after this. I'll, I'll hand back to Paul to, to wrap us up. Great. Thanks for that, Julian. Uh, interesting stuff on community there. And thanks for your questions as well uh, to the panel today. Um, just to remind you, we've got a reputation webinar coming up on May 30th. So it's about a month and a half until the next one. And then after that in July, we've got social authority as well. So thank you very much to Julian. Thank you to the people uh, on the uh, viewers today. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.